In terms of what ergonomics is, it's essentially the design of human machine interactions. And what that means on a more uh, easy to understand level is basically just making products that fit people. Now, the first thing that I wanna look at are these Sennheiser headphones. So there's some really interesting things happening here in terms of signifiers, feedback, comfort, ergonomics. These are really, really well done in terms of ergonomics. So let's talk about this for a second. Basically, one of the first things you'll notice when you put these on is that they're sort of tilted at an angle here. They, and then you twist, you twist them in order to put them on. So really, the only way to turn them on is to actually twist them like this. And basically, you can't put the headphones on without twisting them, right? So that is a very intuitive, very ergonomically sound way of turning the headphones on. And there are a couple signifiers and I want you to listen to them. Just so you guys know, a signifier is really just an indicator or a way of telling you that something is happening basically, right? So the first one is the click. Listen to this, I'll put it near the microphone. Listen to this. So I don't know if you heard that, but there was that nice audible click and then it also said power on. So there were two indicators right there. And then there was an additional one. I don't know if you guys can see this, but if you probably aren't gonna be able to see this, but if you turn this on, there's a light that blinks on this side over here. So you basically have three indicators right away that this thing is on. You have a signifier from the tactile feedback from that clicking, uh, the feeling of it. Then there's the sound that the click makes. And then it actually says power on. And then it also basically gives you the little blinkers here, basically showing you the battery life that's left. So the next thing I wanna talk about is comfort and more specifically comfort as it relates to tension. So this is really interesting because you need that tension sort of going inward, right? You need that, that push in. But at the same time, there are a lot of very sensitive areas on your head, especially near the temple in front of your forehead that do not respond well to pressure or tension. So of course, the way to deal with that is to basically have this nice cushiony pad. So what that's essentially doing is just displacing that pressure and tension over a larger surface area, right? That's all it's doing. If this was pointed and made of metal, it would be very, very uncomfortable and I would not recommend wearing it. So that's an example of comfort and tension. Now, I know you might be thinking like, yeah, obviously you wanna add cushion to something and you don't want sharp edges on areas that you touch. That would seem obvious, right? But it's not. I mean, if you look at the MacBook Pro from the last four or five years, it's got this hard edge right along where your wrist goes. So it is not so obvious to a lot of companies. So one thing that's important about tension is that you really want as little as possible while still offering stability. And there are certain parts of the body that are more resistant to tension and others that are less resistant to tension. Uh, top of the skull, not so bad. Plus there's padding from your hair, assuming you have hair. Um, you know, back of the knee, there are a lot of nerve endings and tendons and areas there that are very sensitive. So and I don't know if you've ever sat on a chair maybe that has like a sharp edge at the edge of the seat. That is something that you really want to avoid. You do not want that. Back to these headphones in terms of padding and tension and pressure. Another thing that's really nice is that these are very highly compliant. They're memory foam. So it basically just sort of molds to whatever the shape of your head is around the area where it's actually making contact with you. And this is called compliance. And this is really important. And you wanna think about this a lot as well, because obviously the less compliant something is or the less it sort of molds to your body easily, the less comfortable it's gonna be. The headband itself actually has a slightly more bouncy feel to it. Maybe they felt that they could get away with a little bit more of a bouncier foam that is a little bit less compliant because it's at the top of the head. Once again, there aren't as many nerve endings there. There's also not as much tension pushing down in that direction. It's more sort of pushing this way, but it's really subtle. These headphones are really comfortable. So the more you can test and build prototypes and test them specifically with your user group, the better. Another thing that you wanna think about as it relates to uh, the shapes and sizes of heads in, in relation to headphones is what percentile you want to design for. And usually you have to decide like, okay, do we want this to fit for, you know, the fifth percentile size of heads up to 95th? That's usually what it ends up being. Or do we need it to fit maybe more from like 50th percentile up to 99th or, you know, it just depends entirely on the project. In terms of where you can get this data, there's a lot of open source data online that you can find. Um, I'll link a couple sources in the description. There's also a lot of uh, 
anthropometric data. I might be mispronouncing that. I'm sorry. I've never actually said it out loud before. But there are also several books on that, which I can also link in the description, which are really helpful. Now, if the open source stuff isn't cutting it and you can't afford, you know, paid, you can't afford to pay for head scans, what you can do is basically just go and look at an existing pair of headphones that fits a lot of people, like maybe some of the Microsoft products or Sennheiser products, and just see what their range was. And that's really important. That'll basically tell you what the adjustability of your product needs to be. Like how far does this need to go out? How far out does this need to flex? That's why it's so important to understand the range of scales and, and sizes that you're working with when you're designing an ergonomic product. By the way, if you've made it this far, I highly encourage you to subscribe. It helps me out, helps the channel out, helps me to make more videos. I'd really, really appreciate it. Also, uh, I started another channel with my friend, Mark Levinson, and it's more of like a jokey channel. It's not so serious. It's a lot more casual, but it's kind of fun. You guys can check it out. It's sort of the lighter side of our personalities, which could be fun to sort of see for yourselves if you're interested in that kind of thing. We basically do product reviews and it's called Honest Unboxing. So the last thing I wanna talk about is actually the chair that I am sitting on. So let's check it out. And one thing that's really interesting about this is that it has a lot of the same principles put into place. The first thing is the adjustability. So very adjustable. But I think what's interesting about the adjustability of this chair is that um, if you look at the handles underneath here, if you look at the handles underneath here, they're completely different shapes and sizes. And that does something that's really interesting. You can make adjustments to the chair while you are sitting on it, which I think is really important. You don't need to actually bend over and, and crane your head down and look down at it. And this actually has origins in airplane cockpits. There were certain controls that were not visible to the pilot while they were flying or even while they were trying to land the plane. And they needed to be able to tell which button was which just by feel or which lever was which just by feel. So that's what this sail chair does very well. In addition to that, it's also really, really good at sort of displacing tension over a larger surface area. So it does two things. It basically displaces tension over a larger surface area, but it also offers support but at the same time, it's very flexible and it's very compliant. It's this just hard to explain, but it's just very, very comfortable. So you wanna think about that. Like what is the right balance between tension, compliance, and just overall you know, balance? Another thing I wanna talk about with the sail chair is that there's like this little ridge right here along the seat cushion. And I think that this is really interesting because this ridge is clearly a design element but it actually creates a little bit of tension in that sensitive area behind the knee that I was talking about. There are a lot of tendons and ligaments back there and it's really, really not ideal to have uh, a break there. Um, and in addition to that, in order to get this like harder edge, they probably needed to use a stiffer foam. Um, usually if you were to upholster a softer foam like this, it would probably sort of like get rounded off in a way that is not attractive. Another thing that I didn't really talk about in this video so much, but is really important, is basically streamlining processes. That's really important to ergonomics. So I might do another video on that. It depends on whether you guys actually want to see it. It's totally up to you. Leave a comment if you do or you don't. Um, but that's another part of ergonomics that I think is really important. And what that comes down to is basically keeping everything sort of within arm's reach and not adding extra steps. And I mean that literally like actual footsteps but also like discrete steps in a process. So anyway, guys, that concludes the video. Thank you so much for checking it out. I really appreciate it. Leave a like, subscribe, comment if you liked the video or if you didn't like the video and if you think I could do a better job, leave a comment about that too. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback. I'm always looking for new video ideas so you can leave a comment about that as well. And thank you so much for your time.